It's about 8 30 in the morning on this beautiful Monday, October 8th, 9th, October 9th, 2023. And I'm moving them into the last cell, the seventh cell of this first section. <clears throat> this afternoon, I'm going to move them to a new section. Uh, the grass here is amazing and wonderful and fantastic and beautiful. The temperature is about 65 degrees. There's a gentle breeze blowing, blowing from the south. Uh, the forecast for today is 85 degrees. We're going to have 80s uh, for the rest of the week. And then Friday, it's going to get in the 70s. And from the weather forecast, we're not going to see another 80 degree day. There might be one more, but we're not going to see another 80 degree day until the spring. So <laughs> enjoy the nice weather while it lasts. It's going to start getting cold. Um, it's time to think about turning your, your uh, heaters on at night. Um, last night was about 55. The rest of the week, it's going to get down to 60 or so. And then after this week, it's going to get into the 50s and 40s at night. So um, grab an extra blanket, put on your warm pajamas. I think uh, a lot of people during the transition of the seasons, that's when they get sick. They expose their bodies to too much heat or too much cold. And uh, you just gotta stay warm, you know, grab an extra blanket if you need to, um, until it's cold enough for your heater to kick on. A uh, Couple things on my mind. Um, the first idea I had was uh, like kind of a message to my past self, like if I could go back in time three years and and tell myself to avoid all the mistakes I made, what would I say? Uh, would my past self even listen? <laughs> That's something to think about. Uh, probably the biggest mistake, I think, was uh, uh, not knowing uh, how to identify if your cows are healthy or not. Um, I, ta I said several videos on this, but being able to identify the condition of your cows just by looking at them. And it's not hard. You just got to learn a little technique. Uh, I'll spend about two minutes here and teach you the technique again. This cow here is in good condition. Do you see her back? Look at her back. It doesn't, the spine doesn't poke out. It's flat across the back. The hip bone, the hip bone there barely protrudes out of the flesh. You cannot see the ribs. The tail has folds of fat, right? Um, that cow is in good condition. The next thing to note is there's like a little dimple from the ribs to the hip bone and down. We call that the triangle. <clears throat> if that's hollow, if it's sunken in, that means they're not getting enough food. So that cow's in good condition and she has plenty of food. That's a good cow. Let's go to a cow that's not in very good condition. This over here is, I think that's number 24. No, that's not number 24. Where's number 24? Where are you? I think she's right. There's a couple cows I can see the ribs on. Oh, this is blue. She's probably mid upper condition. Uh, the reason why I say that is her hip bone is sticking out and you can start to see the ridge on her back. Her tail also, there's not a lot of fat in there. It's starting to hollow out on the tail. All right, let's go find a skinny cow. There, there's number 24. Okay. Maybe I'll keep a skinny cow just so I can show people what a skinny cow looks like. <laughs> okay. Now she's not in terrible condition. She's just not in great condition. Okay. It can get a lot worse than this. But it gets worse, worse by degrees. Let's, let's get in the sunlight here. It gets worse by degrees. Okay. So, number one, there's a ridge down her back. Number two, you can see her rib bones. Three, the hip bone is poking out. Four, there's these bones that go down the ridge between the hip bone and the ribs. You can see them too. Now her triangle is filled in, so she's getting plenty of food. Okay, so she's doing okay there. Um, why is she skinny? Uh, there's a couple theories. Um, people say, people that do cows a lot, they say, oh, she's got worms. That's probably true. Um, that's probably true. If I gave her some deworming medicine, uh, she might just bounce back and recover. Um, the other reason she might be skinny, and it's probably not true now, I can tell because uh, her bags, where the udder is, is empty, right? But she had a big calf, and that calf was milking on her every day. 
and mamas are known to give a lot of milk. Um, and so that calf probably just milked her dry and uh, sucked all the fat off her bones. Uh, so that, oh hey, sheep. So that's the condition of those cows. The sheep are, are a similar story. The problem with the sheep is they have a lot of fur. It's hard to tell. Um, you kind of have to touch them to know how they're doing. But I can tell just by looking at these sheep that they're doing pretty good. Um, their their be bellies are bulging out. That means they have lots of food. Um, you can't see any bones at all. Not not the hip bones, not the back bones, not the rib bones. Uh, their tails have folds of fat, right? So they're all doing pretty good. Okay. Uh, the the mama, that mama there, the older mama, still has milk in her bag. This mama is empty. If that's even a mama, I think that's a lamb. No, that's the mama. Right? So this mama's done giving milk. That mama still has milk. Okay? So that's number one. Being able to identify the condition of your animals is super important and critical. Um, I wish I knew that from day one. The next thing that uh, I wish I would have known is that um, you got to start with fewer animals than you think you need. So I estimated for this field, 60 acres, I said, yeah, I can do like, you know, 40 animals. Now we had droughts, so I had to sell half the animals. Which ones to sell? I sold the ones that were skinny. That's, that's a pretty simple answer. When you sell your animals, you get rid of the ones that aren't doing very well, okay? Obviously there's some strategy, but you have plenty of time to think about that. So, <laughs> I startled her. Uh, fence, so I did uh, T-posts, I had T-posts with barbed wire, and I said I'll just get the T-post clips put the electric wire on there in hindsight I should have uh, put fiberglass rods like about a foot or two feet inside of the perimeter and uh, run the wire on those um, I made a video very recently about how the grasshopper short the fence and uh, that's just it's just a headache it's always causing problems so um, if you have a fiberglass rod, then a grasshopper can't complete the circuit. They have to reach all the way from the wire to the ground. Or from one wire to the next wire. But when it's a T-post, all they have to do is reach around that, that plastic clip. And it's a short. Uh, the placement of the um, wires. I put the bottom wire... Um, my goal was four inches from the ground. <clears throat> which was fine when we were in drought and we didn't have anything growing but in hindsight the grass started to grow and the idea was if I could keep the fence on it would kill the grass around the wire but that just hasn't been the case um, I would say get that bottom wire at least six inches off the ground if not a little more um, we have ant hills that they build up they tend, they tend to build into the wire and cause a short it's really annoying you have to go over there and kick them over. The idea is you want a zero maintenance wire fence. You don't want to have to keep going out there and working on the fence. Um, the process of working on the fence is you have to first identify the problem. You have to find the problem, identify it, and then fix it, right? And on my land, the perimeter is a one and a half miles. I have one and a half miles of perimeter fence to look at. And that's a lot of fence. And when there's a problem, um, I have to use an algorithm that we use in computer science called the binary tree, right? The way that algorithm works is you look halfway where you think the problem might be, right? And you check if the problem's on the left or the right. And if it's on the left, you go to the left halfway of what's remaining and check left or right and so on and so forth, right? Um, that's great in theory. The, in, the issue is you have to keep running back and forth with your side-by-side. -side. So what I end up doing is I just check every so interval. Um, it's more of a linear search, but it saves me having to turn around. Um, uh, my point is not that, you know, uh, you can't optimize finding the problem in the fence. The point is that you have to go along the fence in the end, and it's just annoying to find the problem. That's, that's the biggest issue is finding the problem, not fixing it. Once you find the problem, you can identify it pretty easily. 
and fixing it's pretty easy, but finding the problem, knowing that you have a problem and finding it is a difficult part. So I would recommend building, if you have T-posts with barbed wire, set a perimeter fence like a foot or two inside and run your wires along there. So keep your perimeter fence as a physical barrier and then build that, that uh, electric fence. Uh, the other thing I would recommend, if you plan on getting sheep and goats, um, and I, to a lesser degree, ducks, right? I had a problem with the ducks crossing the fence, and we lost a lot of them. Um, is uh, the barbed wire doesn't work for anything but cows and horses, right? If you're doing anything but cows and horses, you got to get a different perimeter fence. And... I thought I can kind of kludge my way. Uh, kludge is a term that we use in programming. It's when you just kind of force a solution despite the circumstances. I thought I could kludge my way and get um, the effect of like the knotted wire by just putting the wires close together. Um, that works to a degree, but it's difficult. And I would call up my past self and say, hey, just spend the money, tear down the old fence and put up a new fence with the the woven the woven wire. You know. Um, it's going to make your life so much easier to have a physical barrier uh, to keep animals in and out. Dogs. Um, so, I have not bought sheep dogs, but I understand why people will buy them. And based on what I've heard, but not based on my experience, uh, I will say buy a dog that is already trained to protect the sheep, right? Training dogs to protect the sheep when you don't have a dog that protects the sheep. Uh, as far as I know, it's impossible. <laughs> That's my practical experience. I haven't given up, but um, my current strategy is to take the puppies, wean them as soon as I can, and stick them in a pen with the sheep and have them grow up maybe for six months or a year being in constant contact with the sheep. And from what I've heard, that will work to a degree. Um, sometimes the dogs won't take to the sheep. And even like, from what I've heard from Greg Judy, like a lot of his puppies end up not being sheep dogs and he sells them as pets. Like he'll sell them to people and say, these are not sheep dogs. They will not protect your sheep, but they would make a good family pet. They'll protect your house, you know. Um, the issue is that I'm told that when the she when the dogs get older, and when they're like a year old, uh, they like to play, they like to wrestle, and unfortunately, they think the sheep are dogs, and so they will play and wrestle with the sheep, and the sheep do not like that. They they cannot play with the dogs in that way, and there's a good chance that the dogs will kill a sheep, and if they kill one, they'll kill two, and if they kill two, they'll kill ten. And they'll be a predator, you know. So there's a chance, a good chance from what I'm told, that the dogs will start killing the sheep. Not because they're bad animals or because they're hungry, but because they like to play, you know. My dogs, when they were young, they would wrestle all the time. Like, literally all the time. They're jumping on each other, biting each other. And they're not drawing blood, but they're play wrestling very forcefully. And if they did that with the sheep, the sheep would die. Uh, just from a heart attack because sheep can't do that and sheep don't have a way to wrestle back um, the only way the sheep know how to fight is to butt people with their heads um, and to a dog if you run up to a dog and hit it with your head the dog's going to say oh you want to wrestle you know a dog that's kind of silly it's kind of fun behavior so that's the problem that I think I might run into and if the dogs uh, do start wrestling with the sheep I'll have to have some way to stop them from doing that but unfortunately, I won't be watching them 24-7. And so there's a good chance that I'll come out to the pasture and I'll find a dead sheep, a dead lamb. And uh, there won't be any bite marks. There might be some slobber on it. but And the dogs will think nothing of it. You know, but uh, then I have to go and figure out which dog did it. And there's a good chance I'll just have to start over with a new uh, batch of puppies. Hope that they don't kill a sheep. Right? that's the reality of raising sheepdogs so I do recommend and I would tell myself go back and buy some sheepdogs 
And that's still an option on the table. I'm gonna try this litter of puppies. Uh, if they don't work out, I'll try to sell them or whatever. Um, but uh, the point is that uh, you kind of do need sheep dogs, and sheep dogs train sheep dogs. They don't. Uh, um, uh, so if you have one, you can get two and three and four and seven, you know. But uh, if you have zero, you can't get one, right? Maybe if I sat out here with the sheep all day, maybe I could train the dogs to treat the sheep right, but that's just not something I can do. And I certainly can't be out here every day for a year. Um, maybe if I was living on the property or had cameras and I could watch them throughout the day um, out of the corner of my eye, but then I'd have to come here to the property when there's a problem. And you know the way dogs are, they're like little children. You have to discipline them right away when they do something wrong. Otherwise they can't connect um, the behavior with the punishment. They just think you're a mean guy. So anyway, uh, that's kind of thing. Um, shelter for sheep. I know that people say you need shelter for your sheep. I have not seen a need for that. I've lost one sheep to a predator um, uh, the, I, during the ice storm. And I don't know how the sheep died. I just know that when I got to it, it was torn to pieces, right? So a couple possibilities. The most obvious is that some predator came, maybe a neighborhood dog, maybe a coyote, um, and they hunt and kill the sheep, right? Thankfully, it was the other ram. It wasn't uh, a ewe, right? Another possibility is a sheep died from exposure, which I think is a very low possibility. Uh, combination of exposure, malnourishment, I highly doubt that that happened. <clears throat> and then after the sheep died, the, the wild animals came and devoured the corpse and tore it to pieces, right? Um, I think it was the former because when I found the sheep, they were in a different part of the field and they were scared. So there was something that attacked the sheep. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't my dogs. And the reason why I say that is because the sheep did not appear to be scared of my dogs. Right? So, but then again, you know, this is my, what, second, third year of doing sheep and dogs and cattle. What do I know? You know? Um, what else would I give myself advice in? Um... I would say um, don't get the cows until you're ready to rotate. Start rotating from day one. Um, when I got the cows, it was uh, early June, the grass was up to my armpits. And I just turned them into the field because I wanted to trample as much of the field as possible. The issue was I wasn't able to get to rotating the cows until much later. And by the time I got to rotating the cows, all the grass was gone, you know. So start rotating them right away. Um, go for a 21 day rotation. I'm gonna say it, just do 21 days. That's my recommendation. Um, get hay as soon as you can. Um, get ready to get feed, right? So get yourself set up so that you're ready to go to the feed store and get some feed. All right, that's all I got for you for now. Have a great day. Take care and bye-bye.